Yes, we'll see. <laughs> um, You're live. But I didn't hey, copy and paste anything. Well, now they'll have to find the copy and paste thing. So huh. let's see. Uh, <laughs> we'll figure it out. Uh, maybe you just copy and paste this up No, here. no, no. It said it gave us something. So we do not know if we are live. And that is why <laughs> we don't do lives. So this is kind of like the pilot program. So we're trying to figure it out. And I've just been really nervous about going live because the couple of times I've done it before were such like ridiculous clown shows. Um, so I don't know if anybody's watching. <laughs> So what we will do is we will just answer questions and um, don't click anything, please. <laughs> don't click anything. Do not click anything. Okay. Um, so we have this videoing on our video camera also. And we wanted to do for our Patreon is to get questions from people, um, you know, what are you interested in? What are you confused about? All that stuff. So, um, all right. So we have questions here. And the first one is from Paulette. And she says she has a lot of questions. And she's going to narrow it down to three <laughs> that might benefit her art journey. Do we use sketchbooks? And I thought that was a great question because um, it reminded me of when I was in high school. And um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I did not you know, I had no, like, Scott, you wanted to be an artist from very early age. And I didn't, because I had no talent, blah, blah, blah. But I remember seeing a program on George O'Keefe. And I, my dad had gone to the Art Institute of Chicago in Chicago, in that big museum school in, when he was in college. And he bought art. And so when I had shown even the slightest bit of interest in being an artist, he, he said, oh, real artists carry sketchbooks. And I was like, um, oh, okay. So in my mind, I thought real artists carry sketchbooks. So I remember vividly having a sketchbook and carrying it around with me and, and like, oh, and I just had no clue what I was doing. So I felt really insecure. I felt really like a, a, an imposter. And every time I tried to sketch, especially with like a pencil or pen, I, um, it, it was frustrating and it reminded me that I'm not an artist. Um, it took me probably a good 15 years to realize that I don't fit into that, that I am a mass person. I, I do art in mass, meaning I like shape next to shape, value next to value. And I use lines sometimes, but in general, that whole cross hatching, the whole sketchbook um, club was not me. So I, I just love that question where it says, um, you know, you struggle with sketchbooks because firstly you get, you know, you see people, other people doing sketchbooks and you think that's what artists are like. And just wanting to let you know that I'm not a sketchbook artist, but Scott, you have brought sketchbooks on trips and you have yeah. done some nice sketches, but do you consider yourself a sketchbook artist? Well, you know, the thing about when you look online too, is you're going to see so many people uh, doing so many different things, which are which is great about uh, the internet, but it can just keep pulling you this way and that way and this way and this way and thinking, like you said here, sketchbook envy, which made me laugh because yeah, there's some beautiful sketchbooks, but you don't have to do that just because you see other people doing it. So I do use sketchbooks on occasion. Um, when I was in art school, I used it to practice. I would draw from Bridgman and from Vanderpool and stuff, and I would draw all the different pictures in there to practice. Um, I don't use sketchbooks a ton. Uh, when we do figure quick sketch, I use the bigger sketchbooks, but the smaller ones on trips, I really only use it when we're like we're stuck in airports or stuff. And so I'll sketch people or I'll sketch from photos. I will also use them quite a bit to, if I'm wanting to work out some sort of idea that I'm going to do a painting of. And I think, I just don't really have it clear enough. And so I'll do maybe a sketchbook and I'll do some sketches to figure out what composition do I want? What pictures do I want to? So I use it more as a tool, not as an end thing. Now, some of the sketches on trips come out beautiful and I will sell them occasionally. Um, but usually if I had more time and I had the model posing, I would do a, a 
painting and the sketchbook. So, do you find that you're comfortable working in like pencil or graphite? Yeah, I love working in pencil. Yeah, it's it's really fun for me. And I'll, I a lot of times now I use the pencils, those those ones that you get that are the mechanical pencils, so you don't have to sharpen them. I just keep mm -hmm. we'll we'll do it and I'll do the sketches. Uh, but yeah, I enjoy them quite a bit. Uh, they're just fun to do. You know. So. Well, I just so we're different. Yeah. Like it, it's not comfortable for me to do sketchbooks. Um, so you don't have to be a sketchbook artist, no, just to let you know. Yeah. Um, but good questions. So this is also Paulette. I paint sports, so movement is a big thing in my work. It haunts my nightmares how to get it right. I'm doing okay, but I feel I, have real, I haven't really mastered it yet. Is movement something you consider bringing into your art? I'm trying to remember if I've seen you tackling that subject. So we do like movement in general. We are really attracted to like dancers, um, Scott, but we do those from like photographs and um, we do like things in mid motion too. So I guess how, how do you describe painting um, movement? And do you have any like tips? Well, like you mentioned about edges and stuff, you can get a sense of movement through that. Sometimes I, I think of some like Tony Ryder and some of the great artists who Right, right. Artists, uh, some of the ones who have done figures and movement and stuff. No, I um, think I think you're Ron uh, Robert Liberace. Robert Liberace, yeah. And and sometimes they will use where they'll be repeating, uh, you know, the the motion. You'll actually see different different parts. And I've I've done those things before, but uh, most of the time when I'm doing paintings and I'm trying to convey movement, uh, I tend to do a lot more with the background to show it. Mm -hmm. So even if you think about like horse horses, you know, running or somebody running or something. Uh, a lot of times you want to freeze the moment. Now you can you can have a little blur, uh, and that will convey movement. But oftentimes when you're actually tracking something moving, you notice how the background is is kind of out of focus. It's moving because you're tracking the subject. And so even if that's not in the photograph, I often will try and work the background to try and suggest movement. In fact, like a painting that. Susan had her father bought before we even met at a show and I was doing um, uh, dancers uh, these from like the Renaissance gypsy dancers Fair. from Renaissance fairs and I the one that they, they that her dad bought it was it's a girl who's obviously in movement dancing um, but she is there's a little bit of blur on some of her arms but mostly it is the background I used very uh, gestural brush strokes and things like that and that gave the sense of movement so that's usually how I do it, but there's a million ways. Yeah, I think in that. general, though, like if you really wanted something to look moving, mm -hmm. then you wouldn't have, it wouldn't be very detailed, right? I mean, it wouldn't have like super hard edges. Like everything would be just like maybe, you know, kind of soft and blurry. Like it would seem like if someone's going past you. Yeah. Um, but like, yeah, your strokes in the background of that painting were like very like swooping, almost like wind. Right. Right. So like, um, but yeah, I guess... I would, I would think someone who does a lot of sports would have to like think about that more than someone like us Absolutely, who are doing yeah. a lot of models that are sitting. Yeah. Finally, people are talking a lot about intentions and I'm panicking that it's not something I really consider my own art. Maybe it's for the uh, reserve of abstract artists, but do you set out with an intention when you begin a painting? Scott and I, when we first got this question, we actually did have a long conversation about intention. Um, I think you had a lot more to say about it than me. Um, I think it's just intentions. I think people nowadays are just starting to talk about art differently. You know, I think that maybe with the um, social media and that there's so many workshops and there's so many artists putting themselves out there. And also, I guess, just society. We're all like kind of becoming a little bit more self-actualized or questioning ourselves. Why do we do art? How do we actually create something that's important? So I just think that on mass, people are really evaluating art and not just as a product. But um, but what, what were you going to say about intentions? Oh, uh, well, to me, words like intentions are they're somewhat uh, abstract words themselves. So many people use those words differently. So some people may say, you know, have intention in your work and they're meaning do something politically motivated. So the political intentions, you're trying to say something about, you know, uh, 
uh, women's rights or about whatever it is, global warming, you're doing paintings with those intentions. But intentions can mean just about anything, okay? So, I mean, you can do a painting and your intention is to just convey beauty of a landscape, convey the beauty of a person, uh, to your intention is to paint something that is personal to you, that is just something you're interested in, or your intention can sometimes be simply to challenge yourself. Uh, so intentions are, there's so many different things. And so I could talk about personally for me, and usually it's going to be specific to a painting because there's certain paintings I have that maybe are intended to kind of open people's eyes to some something in Tibet or something here. Uh, but that's usually secondary to the beauty of the subject. Um, so that will be personal to you. And I wouldn't wouldn't stress about it if somebody else has a different definition of intentions that you're no longer a valid artist because those intentions are the only important ones. Sorry, I know it's it's a it's a deep conversation, but I just think that it's just in general in society that we are all becoming a little bit more um, reflective and um, spiritual on my part. So, um, but if you don't if you don't think deeply and you like you know I mean I don't I think it's don't try and worry so much about what, what other people doing because obviously you're very passionate about art and you're very passionate about what you're doing so i think you're kind of on the right track and um that's all that's important and it's interesting because you know that people will make you feel bad about what you paint so people might say well why paint flowers that's so you know that's so uh you know sweet or sweet or yeah. something it's it, it, it's it's shallow and yet it's beautiful and we're i mean the fact that people are drawn to this and I was actually talking to um, Dean Mitchell and some other artists uh, who are black uh, at one of the shows. And um, they were talking about the fact that sometimes being a minority, uh, a woman was telling me this too, how issues, you know, and this can happen if you're black or Hispanic or whatever. Or does that pressure, uh, you know, where people are saying you things uh, for this, you know, movement because of who you are. And you might not be interested in that. And, and maybe you'll do some paintings like that or not, but uh, it's it's something that you really have to ignore because uh, the idea that, I mean, that's why I did that whole Banishment of Beauty talk, you know, is showing that just beauty is something profound. And that doesn't mean everybody should paint beauty. I love paintings that are about political things or people who go out and document, uh, you know, places that are important uh, that things are happening or wars or whatever, they're all good. And uh, don't let yourself be talked into, I need to do this because this is what people are telling me is important and I want to be an important artist. You do the things that are important to you and then it will be unique and, and it will be, mm-hmm. have that intention, you know, yeah. personal intention. Yeah. It's a hard kind of question. It is. It's a um, good question. Yeah. Though. Yeah. It's good. yeah. Um, so from Lynn, Lynn Huntley. Thank you, Scott, for pulling back the mystery curtain on using layers in Photoshop. It's something I've wanted to learn for a long time. Uh, There are a couple of things that I'm having trouble piecing together, though. Question, how do you get the mask mask to cover just one area? And then I wrote Lynn and said, well, he uses like the brush tool. And that is something that's a little bit hard to like talk about right here. And that's why we do Photoshop. And I just really, I just kind of ask you guys to take some time and watch those Photoshop videos, especially the ones that we're making on just one specific thing. They could be like eight minutes and it is literally showing you how to mask something, how to use a history brush. And I try my hardest to make them simple for mine. Scott's a little bit more advanced, but, um, and if you really do have um, a complete, a real serious, like you just need help, well, I mean, honest, I'm just going to say, and you want one-on-one, then just for one month, just do the top tier. And Scott and I, or I will help you literally through the computer, through Zoom for an hour, and I will help you work on something in Photoshop. So sometimes it's hard to describe something just verbally or through a text. And if you really need help with Photoshop, I mean, we're here to help you, but please watch the videos. Um, and if you do those on Zoom or when you're even when you're watching the videos on online uh the best thing to do on zoom is to click record so that because we'll share the screen and go through the steps 
but it's hard to absorb all that the first time. So even with these videos, watch them a second time, and it's nice that you can pause it, and you can open Photoshop, and you can go back and forth, and you can do the next step, and then play it, and then do the next step. Mm -hmm. And you'll have to do that a couple times to kind you of do, even take notes sometimes, yeah. you know? Taking notes yeah. is like steps. It's And I just want to let you guys know that, I mean, even though I use Photoshop every single day, I, if I haven't used a specific tool in a few weeks, even I will forget completely. I'm like, Oh my God, how do I get back to that? So, um, there's just a few things that you need to learn. And then when you kind of want to do something a little more advanced, that's why these videos are here. So, but we, we yeah. really want to help you with Photoshop. And for individual tips. When I forget something, how to do a particular thing, I'll quickly Google it. And <laughs> usually there'll be something on that one little yeah. thing, either written or yeah. a little video. So yeah, it'll help. So Anne uh, Austin Stickney said, I just have one dumb question. On the small half tone where the light on the face rolls into shadow, isn't that usually warm? This question is answered in the video on Zorn palette. It's more colorful there, according to Scott. I realize answers may vary um, depending on who you're talking to, just like anything else. I'd also appreciate it if Scott would remind me what the details are. Okay, first let's do halftone. So um, Scott, it's halftones do have to deal with the light source that you're working with and it is all relative, but you probably explain that really well. Well, yeah, the, the reason that oftentimes halftones have more color is because, and it depends well, on the type of too, light. warmer too, that, that they might be well, warmer. Warmer or cooler is going to depend on your light. Okay. But first of all, they'll have more usually chroma because of like you mentioned, because the lights get so much white in them and then the shadows will generally get more darker. So if you look on your palette, the brightest colors are going to be more in the middle range. So even if you have like ultramarine blue to actually really see the beauty of color, you're going to have to add a little white to get it to the middle. If you had too much white, it gets more washed off. So that's, that's as far as the color. Uh, and certainly when you do more impressionistic color, many times you'll move the darkest darks, you'll move everything to the middle. The lights will be just like Kevin McPherson would do with his paintings. So uh, impressionism, high key meaning, yeah. you know, pastel colors next right. to each other. So yeah, the lightest lights, you'll move them more to the middle and the darkest darks, you'll move them more to the middle. You won't have extremes and so they'll, they'll have more color in them. Um, now, as far as the temperature, that has to do with the light. It also has to do with bounce light, all that sort of thing. So if you're working with a warm light uh, and you have it on something that is whatever color or white or, or thing, it's going to warm up the lights. So the local color plus that is going to make it warm. So as it goes into the shadow, that little half tone is generally going to still be in the light. And so it's still going to be that warmer color usually. Um, and then as it goes into the shadow, it will become cooler. And again, this is relative. So if it's a red apple, the warms on the red apple uh, and the lights will be warm. They'll still be red. And then the reds in the shadow will still also be red. They'll just be a cooler red. And that little band along the, the center will usually be very warm because it's as it goes into the shadow it hasn't yet gone into the shadow so it still has the light it's kind of uh like a halo now if you have a cool light it'll be the other way around so that band in there might be a, a cooler red that is yeah and it's, also like, it's brighter. relative though on a face so totally we relative. do say that there's blood and there's skin so it's a living organism so you know if you have that pretty red on the right where the cheek goes into shadow it might be a cooler pink you know, depending on a cool light, but it seems warm to you because you're, you, you know, pink still seems warm, but it's a cooler pink um, than maybe like, uh, you know, so it is kind it's of rel relative. It's relative, yeah, it's relative to it, relative. but that's usually because you were talking about a face. Right. So, you know, faces, we tend to have flesh. The, no, every human of, of any color will have flesh. So it has warmth to it. Um, but I remember, I just remember thinking when you, I look at paintings from like Sargent or Cecilia Bow, and whenever they're doing like fabric or some other things, sometimes they will have like pure blue on a half tone of the fabric because of the light is a cool source. So it's, it is about kind of, you know, maybe putting accents here or there, but on skin, if you're having a realistic skin tone in the light, then you're not going to put like a blue purple on the half tone. It's going to be a relatively warm you know, tone as it goes into the shadow. So it's all relative. Mm -hmm. It could be a hotter red or a cooler red, mm -hmm. but it's just 
relatively looks warmer than the actual light source because white is cool, you know, because when you're adding white to, as you said, it gets like it loses color. So it looks cooler. Right. Where you'll see it the most is on a very light skinned person. Like if you have we've painted people with red hair who have just the lightest skin. Almost blue, almost porcelain. Yeah. And so if you have them under a north light or a uh, as it turns into the shadow, you'll get these almost bluish purples on it. But that's because, again, they don't have as much of the uh, the warm that if you other different um, uh, people with different skin tones, it'll still be very brown or very pink. Yeah, if it's or, like a high, yeah. if it's like an overcast or a soft light, right. you know, like Nancy Guzik paints all the time. Well, then, yeah, the, her little colors that she puts right on where something turns is going to be maybe a slightly bit more of a cooler pink. Then if you're doing it under another And there light. you're talking about just the light itself. Now, when you're painting outdoors or even in, in different rooms, you'll have the sky reflecting in. You'll have things reflecting off the grass. So you can get some pretty bright colors, purples and things, even in the light from, yeah. from the sky reflections yeah. too, the blue. So it's uh, usually you just got to really look and move your eye around so you can see the relative colors. And don't don't overthink it to where you're trying to make a formula out of, okay, this is a warm light, this is this, and so this should be this color. Use your eyes, move them back and forth and around. Keep them moving. That's what like Kevin would say, is you always keep your eyes moving when you're trying to judge a color. Don't look only at that color by itself. Good question. It's something to yeah. keep us, see, I wanted to ask questions, so it's something for us to remember when we're making videos to talk about it and try mm -hmm. and think about it. Um, yeah. Okay. So she also asked, um, could you remind her what the details are on the LED lights? Like, um, I actually have one. Over? Well, I actually have one in the corner there. Do you see that? I can bring I it over here. I don't know if we can see it. So we got... I'll oh. be seeing it. Oh, yeah. No, see, Scott, it's right there. So it's like an older version. Why don't you twist it so that we can just see the front of it? So these are really old LEDs. I probably had these for like eight years. Um, we got them from B&H Photo. We still have them. They still work. So why spend money on new ones? I also have one that's over my palette table on an arm. And we have newer ones that are smaller. You can't even get these anymore. I think these are actually antiquated. But um, just go to B&H Photo in New York City. Look for LED lights. And these are the kind that you can get cool, go cooler, go warmer, dimmer, uh, brighter. Um, but in general, these are kind of clunky and, and uh, big. <laughs> these are so heavy. The newer ones I have yeah, are they're just like little. little panels. They're really thin. Mm -hmm. And then they all have it on the back here where you can see that you can switch the, uh, the color once it's turned on. Yeah. You can see the color. You can change the color temperature and you can change the intensity. But like I said, B&H has newer versions that yeah. are much thinner um, and they're not that expensive. I mean, you can get like, I think, two for maybe $150, $200. Sometimes they come with stands, but LED from B&H and they're, these are pretty much what everybody uses now. Oh yeah, they're so much cheaper, so much lighter. So yeah, that's, and don't worry, they, they all work kind of the same, so. So here's a question from Liz. This is such a great opportunity. Thank you. I second the questions about depicting movement. Beyond the idea of softening edges, do you tend to add brush strokes in the direction of the movement? That's kind of what we were saying is that like Scott in the backgrounds, a lot of times we're having a lot of like strokes or palette knife or kind of leading you in a direction. So that is, um, or do you paint lighter images of the subject as if it was more in a time-lapse photo or both. I know how people depict movement in cartoons, but how do you keep it from looking cartoonish in a paintings? I mean, I do think that when I see a lot of artists who literally kind of don't almost have any edges, it's like everything is a little bit diffused and they're kind of like maybe like the, the you know, they're really kind of, you see it when people do it well, it really works. Um, it takes a lot of practice, uh, but let's see what, see what, I know how people depict movement, blah, 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 blah. But being analytical for a moment, I'm trying to understand why the most saturated colors are sometimes in the halftone. So Scott was just saying that it has everything to do with how light in our eyes, you know, see the, the most colors are right when things are transitioning. And um, do you have anything else to say about why colors are, so, are more saturated right in the halftones? 
Uh, oh, I think we talked about that. Yeah, I was just, just wondering the if there's anything wise. else. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that's mainly the reason, yeah. How do you make this bigger? Could you make this bigger? Yeah, uh, let's see here. Okay. Um, all right. Do, do, do. Yeah, because light tends to wash out colors a little bit. Yeah. So that's, that's just why, the nature of yeah. color, yeah. On the shadow side, do you get any influence from the temperature of the light as you move towards the light? I mean, not probably. only if it bounces. So when a light, if, if you're using like Caravaggio sort of light where you have dark walls and nothing's bouncing in, you're just going to get almost black uh, shadows. Nothing from the light is affecting it. When it bounces back in, it has more to do, unless you're on like a white card or something, you might get then some of the color as it bounces back, some of the warmth then as it bounces back, uh, but it'll still be cooler than the actual direct light. So that's why relatively cooler. Now, but generally when it's bouncing back, it's going to have more to do with what the surface it's bouncing back on. So if somebody has a red shirt on and it's bouncing off of this back into the shadows or bouncing off a wall that's a color, or if you're painting outdoors and there's there's trees here, it'll give a green cast. Or So it has more to do with the uh, what, what the surface that it's bouncing off on, if that makes sense. Yeah. So she also had a technical question. Um, she's painting a little excuse me, a little girl's face, and it looks fairly good, but I wanted to tweak a few spots. So she said she was using that oleo gel. We have personally never used that. Now, um, I have used when I needed to do some subtleties where I would do like Gamsol and Galkid together, like a half and half, or I've done um, a little bit of that solvent free gel that comes like in a tube from Gamblin. I've also done uh, like linseed oil with Gamblin. You know, these are all like little things where you would make a little mixture, you'd paint it right, like say right on the face, don't put too much. And then when you paint on top of it, it just all kind of blends together. We have not used the oleo gel. And just recently, we have not been able to get um, retouch varnish spray. I finally spray. got it a couple oh, of days you did? ago. Yeah. Oh, it did come in the mail? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. but for months, I think all because of COVID, we were not able to yeah. get the spray retouch right, varnish for right. some reason. And Scott was really like complaining because he paints so thick that for him to wait, you know, weeks even to get the painting to where it was dry enough that he could do one of those Rush oil, on boiling out methods, oil, yeah. you know, it's just... It was kind of impractical. Yeah. You could buy the retouch in liquid form, but to get it in the spray was crazy. I don't yeah. know why. But anyway, so we recently just heard about an artist who uses walnut oil and gal kid, and he mixes that together. Um, there's also that mixture that I, we really just bought recently, and I'm testing it out in little bits, the walnut oil and Alkid. Now we've been Googling stuff and you hear both sides is it's good. It's bad. It, it's archival. It's not. So, I mean, we are not experts. But so for the, her specific question about that, honestly, the best way is if you have some retouch varnish spray and you can just give a light spray to the areas that have gone flat, because what will happen is they'll go flat and the darks will look lighter than they are. And so you'll think, Oh, I've got to go on there and, and if you're trying to match the color when you paint on it and then you spray it, you'll be shocked because now it won't match. Uh, the colors will be different from when you paint it. So, um, so I'll give it a little spray. That way I'll know what it is and I can paint on top of that. Yeah, um, but she was saying her paintings look blotchy. And I think this is like a universal thing is that we yeah. all deal with our paintings, dry, our oil drying at different times. And how do we keep the colors? And I was saying we were just listening to a abstract artist who paints incredibly thick. Mm -hmm. And he said he doesn't use um, mediums at all, but I could tell, and he doesn't varnish his paintings. And some of the paint looked really shiny. And he says he uses the walnut oil and the gal kid, and that keeps a shine to his paint. Just in those strokes that he puts down in the other areas were flat. Yeah, but he, he wants to do yeah. that. But, but if you it, yeah. like were painting a lot of darks or if you wanted to just try that, I would test it out. Uh, so we're not experts. I know that Gamblin has a really great website with a lot of information and they answer questions. You know, really, they're right. good responsive. Most any art supply places do do that. But um, there are so many different ways. That Scott uses do a this. lot of retouch. Yeah. I mainly just do it that way where I'll put retouch and I don't mind painting over dry things with uh, 
so that's so I know I'm not really an expert on it. Yeah, know, you don't mind. Do yeah. I mean, like I, I paint thinner. So when my stuff gets really flat, mm -hmm. sometimes it is really difficult. I do use retouch varnish spray. I do remember the guy at Gamblin said not to use it, but it is oiling out your paintings a lot it can be also you also don't want to put too much oil on your painting. So it's tricky. I think we're all just trying to figure it out. And um, anyways, the newest thing that we're using is the, I am at least the walnut oil with the, uh, like the Galka, just to test it out and see if it still works. Right. Okay, the next question from M. Fernandez Jimenez. Um, I have a question regarding a camera. I had a Nikon D3100 for 12 years, but now it seems time to update and improve as it started to give me some trouble. I went to the shop and got overwhelmed. May I ask what we would be the best thing to buy? This is the dilemma, the choices um, area, Nikon DSLR or Nikon mirrorless. And I really like to take good references for portrait painting. We looked at Nikon D7500 and Nikon DZ. The mirrorless is new technology, but somehow we seem to like the DSLR better, despite it's being older and less detailed and sharpness. So, um, we don't have any mirrorless cameras, but why don't you talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah, there's lots of new mirrorless cameras. I'm still using, um, I got a new, I have, we've, we had the uh, Nikon uh, D7100. So it's similar to the one you had. It's a, it was a newer version. Um, so it's still a uh, SLR, uh, both that one and then the Canon I got, I got a new Canon because they're discontinuing the SLRs. And so this was a very expensive camera, like $5,000, but it was on sale because they're discontinuing it. Um, I forget what the exact model well, is. I we think, have it on our videos. But, but yeah. Um, but so that one's mirror, that one is a uh, SLR, but it also has a button on the back where you can press it and you can do it, use it as a mirrorless one. So you can just have the thing on the back and you can do all your adjustments and look at it. So it kind of has the, the best of both. Um, the advantages of an SLR over the mirrorless are there's two main advantages. One is when you are out shooting and you have to have the picture on the screen rather than just looking through and taking pictures, that uses quite a bit of battery. So if like for us, when we go off sometimes on trips that we're way off in the middle of nowhere, I'll bring extra batteries and things, but we might not be able to charge them for a week. Um, and so, and if I'm shooting a lot in a day, you can very quickly well, if you have your screen on all the time, and I mean, we've been in times in India and places like this where we're just shooting all day. It's a festival and stuff, and you shoot lots. Of those. Um, and if I had the uh, mirrorless one, you probably in a half hour with all the shooting by having this big uh, drawback. You can bring extra batteries if you're be a problem. So that's the one advantage is the you can just shoot without that and not reviewing your pictures and it will last quite a long time if you're not constantly bringing them up on the screen. Um, the other advantage is a lot of the SLRs will shoot quite a bit faster. So we did a photo session with a model who was dancing and I can put it in, uh, not, not have it on the screen then and I'm just shooting it as an SLR and I can shoot like, you know, five to seven frames per second, um, which uh, a lot of the mirrorless cameras don't. The high-end ones I've heard can shoot really fast. So um, there's not really that much of a difference as far as the, the, the quality of the pictures. Um, uh, so it's really just, I, I won't have any problem moving to the mirrorless ones since they're going to be discontinuing those. I'm not like... You mean the to DSLR, it. I mean? Eventually they're, they're discontinuing them. So I'm mm -hmm. sure in another 10 years, everything will be mirrorless or it might be some other technology. Uh, but I'd have no problem working with the mirrorless one. Um, uh, so just to yeah. say that the Canon that you really love right now, you've got on, and they're actually still selling it at B&H. We've noticed mm -hmm. it's still on their website. Yeah. I think you spent like $1,500 or 15 mm -hmm. or 16, and then you had to buy a lens, which was another 300 or right. something. Right. So you got this great camera for under $2,000. Right. Um, we still have Nikons. But you are very happy with your Canon. You think that the pixels I, and everything. I, I would is have bought Nikon's because you are once you have lenses, it's hard to switch. But that camera I mainly bought because it's a, a 50 megapixel, and we needed larger um, resolution for prints. 
really, I don't need that camera for painting from. You have so much resolution already on the other cameras that it wasn't a necessity. It's nice having it because then you can zoom way in. And, and uh, But for painting, it's not necessary. Uh, I really like the camera, but mainly it was very specifically for us to get some high resolution shots because we started doing doing a few prints, um, yeah. you know, just of small editions, um, like 40 uh, prints. And uh, but we could then shoot the picture and we can then print it the size of the painting. We can talk forever. So these lives are not meant to be for long. <laughs> They're supposed to be like just people asking us questions and just seeing our faces instead of just always looking at our paintings in our Reading, hands or, yeah, right. you know, but that you actually see our personalities and that we want people to ask us questions. We want to know what videos you're interested in. So as we go forward, we'll make them. The last question is, hi, Scott and Susan. This is from Andy S. I would really appreciate it if you would be able to give some insight on how to approach the painting of fabrics clothing. I've developed a tendency to avoid it at all costs. Okay, so how I would say painting fabrics is first of all, you know, what I see a lot of times, if, if, okay, I'm gonna just bring up Sargent again. Study someone like Sargent because what it, how he painted fabrics was he edited, he gave you like 20% of what was there in real life. So a lot of times when we're studying art, we think we have to do every fold, every wrinkle, every single twist and turn. So when someone like Sargent is telling us that no, it's like the larger picture and then just, like if there are 20 folds, give us three or four. Don't give us 20 folds. Like simplify and edit. It's like anything, like hair. And also thinking about, um, fabric as sculpture as three dimension so that there are, you know, parts of the fabric that's closer to you and parts of the fabric that's farther away from you. And so when you're doing edges or you're making accents, you know, lead people to where you want them to look. Don't have the same sharpness or the same value of like your darkest darks everywhere. You want to lead people through it. So it's like, you know, maybe your darkest dark is only in one area where you really want people to look. And so your values trail off. So it is having a hierarchy of values. Really tell people where to look. Your strongest colors, your lightest lights and your darkest darks are going to be in a certain area. Um, edit. Don't draw. Don't do every fold. Um, and I guess you have anything to say. Well, um, especially you're talking about portraits. No, it's uh, talking about just fabrics and clothing. Fabrics in general. Um, so, you know, the, uh, you know, when painting at all costs, when you're painting portraits, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, the, the thing about fabric is, and what Sue's talking about looking at other artists is very important. And whenever I'm having trouble with things or learning things, I will take out books of artists that I really like. Books are nice because you can actually hold the picture up and you can look at your painting and look at it and it will jump out at you and you'll see what Sargent or Zorn or Mancini are doing. Uh, as far as for a portrait, one of the important things I think is simplifying like Sue said, but also making it interesting. Fabric is a wonderful opportunity to set off the realism that you have in the face because that's gonna be more drawn out and more, more detailed refined. and refined. And so when I've, whenever I'm doing a portrait, um, I put one on uh, Patreon of my, our friend Michael that I did. And so you saw how I was able to have so much fun with just these fabric and stuff. But it's the same thing when I do a more finished portrait of a person. When I get to the fabric or the background too, but the fabric on something, is that's an excuse now where I can play. So if you try and paint it all detailed, it's going to be boring and then it's going to compete too much with the face. So you've got the realism part. Now use that as an example to play with the abstract. Mm -hmm. So Mancini did that wonderfully. Zorn, Sargent, um, uh, Klimt. Soroya, Klimt. Look at how they take the, the fabric as an excuse to use big strokes or in, in Mancini's mm -hmm. case, using texture, break things up, make it a little more abstract. And when it's a little more abstract and you still have the form in there, it will suggest it and people will just know what it is. It's really when you get too too detailed that people will start saying, well, that doesn't look quite right. right. Or it's heavy it, or it's too yeah, too much information. It either has to be completely detailed or you have to, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, use use some, make that as an excuse. I mean, if you look at like 
uh, Shane Neal and, and some of them, they, they do refined, beautiful portraits that people want very detailed. But then when they get to the fabric, they'll it's gestural. more sketchy and gestural because that, that, then you have that play of the mm -hmm. slightly abstract against realism. So that would be my advice um, on that. Yeah. So this has gotten so long. Um, thank you. I thank you. If anybody's watching this or if you watch us in the future, thank you. And we hope to get better at doing lives and also to be able to like, answer questions more concisely, I guess, but Scott and I are both talkers. <laughs> we are talkers. So that, you know, hopefully you like to listen and to And hopefully talkers. in the future we'll be able to take the questions. As yeah. We do. So, we're so we're learning still about learning. these live stream yeah. things. And I'm not sure if this is really even working as a live stream. And that's why we're filming this as like a dual mm -hmm. thing, just in case I have to post it. Um, yeah. I, that's why I'm nervous about doing them, but I want to like have these so that oh, there's, yeah. it's like, you know, there's just all kinds of variety of stuff. So anyways, uh, we so appreciate your support. We so appreciate anyone that is in the art journey with us and we love hearing from you. So we'll just keep doing them, making lots of mistakes. Okay. <laughs> Bye. <Happy painting. laughs>